You're watching A Court Leader's Advantage, a video podcast for court professionals and by court professionals. Brought to you by thecourtleader.net in cooperation with NACOM, the National Association for Court Management. International work can be challenging. It can also be very rewarding. But no matter what, it's an adventure that you'll remember for the rest of your life. Have you ever thought about it? Wondered if it was for you? Where would you even go to get your questions answered? I'm Pete Kiefer, and welcome to the Court Leaders Advantage podcast series. This month, we're talking to folks who have served as consultants on the rule of law assignments in countries across the globe. From Russia to Vietnam to the Pacific Islands, these panelists have seen it all. And now you'll hear their stories firsthand. This episode is going to give you a taste of what it's like to be on an international assignment. First, though, let's tell you about NACOM's own forum for those who are involved in international work and those who are interested in learning more about it. Michelle Oaken is a past president of NACOM and has been chair of the International Committee for a number of years. Welcome, Michelle. Now tell us, what is the focus of the International Committee and how long has it been around? The International Committee has been in place, actually was implemented nine years ago by the NACOM board. And the purpose was so that we would have the opportunity to reach out to international associations and organizations to promote the importance of court administration and encourage partnerships with NACOM. Additionally, the committee is a valuable contact point and resource for other countries and or project leaders seeking contacts and administrators to provide specialized technical assistance. So the committee has created a number of resources for international work, and those can be found on the NACOM website. And I'm just going to highlight a few of those. There's a brochure that Uh, speaks to the committee's purpose and mission. Uh, We have a document that highlights international hosting tips and FAQs, a resource guide for international engagements. So those would be documents that could be used by somebody that was uh, working with another country on court association or court formation work. And then the newest documents are court association templates, which we uh, partnered with the International Association for Court Administration on completing and posting on both of our websites. Thanks, Michelle. Now let's join our panel of international consultants. We're joined today by Norman Meyer, court leader contributor with 38 years of experience as a trial court administrator in the U.S. federal and state courts. Pam Harris, State Court Administrator for the Maryland Court System. Pamela Ryder Leahy, Court Management Consultant with 41 years of experience, and most recently, Chief Executive Officer for the Supreme Court of Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. John Sipperly, Senior Program Manager with the International Division of the National Center for State Courts. And Janet Cornell, Court Consultant with over 35 years of experience with both general and limited jurisdiction courts. Thank you all for joining today's podcast. Let me start with the question, how and why did you get involved in international work? Pam Harris? Uh, My first involvement with international work started in 2000, the year 2000, with a call from one of our appellate judges who was involved with the Russian American Rule of Law Consortium, which was funded by USAID from 1996 to 2011. The consortium was initially established with two sister state agreements with Maryland and St. Petersburg and Vermont and Karelia, but it grew over the years to include nine states involved with sister state relationships with our Russian counterparts. The main focus of the organization was to improve the capacity of local Russian legal institution and to help them implement reform. Over the years, Ray Rock was instrumental in the development of bar associations, judicial and lawyer education programs, court administration initiatives that expanded the gamut, technology, juries, domestic violence, security, assignment, you name it, land use, 
the list goes on. Um, but I'd like to preface my com comments with uh, a childhood description for those of you who might be watching that haven't been around long enough. Uh, during the Cold War, um, survival lessons were taught in schools. Um, sirens went off and students were required to duck underneath their desks until the sirens stopped. And, and, then, and then you couldn't come out until you were told it was okay. Uh, the U.S. was obviously worried about nuclear attacks from Russia. And through conversations with our Russian counterparts, the Russians grew up with this same exercise as children. Now, certainly the relationships over the years since the Cold War with Russia became much better, but unfortunately, as you know, uh, Russian American relationships have taken a very wrong turn. But on my first trip back in 2000, where I thought it would be my first and last trip, uh, we were asked to present on a seminar providing a detailed description of how the judicial system functioned in Maryland and particularly the role of the trial court and the state court administrator, their relationships. Um, you see, after the establishment of a new Russian constitution in 1993 and the creation of an entirely new court structure and the waning of their armed forces, Moscow distributed, dispersed 2,000 former military personnel to courts all over Russia and assigned them as court administrators with no training in court administration and with no input from judges in those courts, no input whatsoever. Um, and as I'm sure many of you can imagine, there were trust issues between the judges and the administrators and issues of line of authority. <laughs> they were prevalent. And I, and I know that many of you um, probably have experienced that in, in, your own, um, in your own work. So making a very long story short, I became initially involved with international consulting as, a, as I was a trial court administrator. Um, uh, the court I worked in was considered a high performing court. Our appellate court recognized our accomplishments and the courts in the St. Petersburg region were interested in court administration and how it worked in the US. Norman, and, and in some respects, I'm gonna build on what Pam just talked about. Uh, uh, as a, as a kid, uh, you know, uh, I'm part of that generation as well that hid under the desks and such and tried to, you know, deal with if the nuclear bomb went off uh, nearby. Uh, I lived in a suburb of New York City, so we knew we were a prime target. But in college, um, I majored in, in, in uh, political science and international relations and, and Russian studies. And then in my career over time, I never really got back to it until I became the clerk of the U.S. federal court in Eastern Virginia. And, and my office was in Alexandria, just across the Potomac from Washington, D.C. And this was a time period in the late 90s. Um, and as that, as Maham was just talking about, the fall or the breakup of the Soviet Union had happened uh, a few years previously. And lots of delegations were coming to Washington, D.C., uh, to from, uh, from international courts to see how did we do it? Um, uh, you know, get lessons, um, and there was a Russian delegation that came to the administrative office of the, of the U.S. courts in D.C., and the people there knew that I had at least some Russian background and Russian studies um, back in college, and I will also say that I spent my honeymoon with my dear wife, Millie, in 1976 traveling on a camping tour of Western Soviet Union uh, for the summer of 1976, and so uh, <laughs> that shows you how crazy I was about uh, uh, going abroad and, and, and also uh, Russia and the Soviet Union. So, okay, back to 1999, a, a delegation from the Russian um, courts came to Washington, D.C., and I was on a team of Americans who were hosting them and talking about American courts, and they were looking at different models of administrative structure for their courts to do reforms, as Pam was talking about with her project. And eventually they modeled their administrative structure for the general jurisdiction type courts, not the commercial courts, on the federal court system in the United States in terms of a centralized administrative office and then regional offices and that sort of thing. And so they invited a team of us to come to, these, to, to Moscow for an inaugural conference. And there were 300 people there. I was part of a team with a, 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 a federal judge from, Washington, uh, from Minnesota, Judge Magnuson, as well as people from the AO. 
And I was invited to present about what is trial court administration. And so I made this big presentation at this conference outside of Moscow in the dead of winter. It was, it was December. It was really cold and snowy. Uh, and then also, and this is related, relevant to, to this being a NACOM podcast, um, they asked me to present about NACOM. And I made a presentation about what is NACOM, what does it do? Uh, I'd been president of NACOM just a couple of years previously. And so uh, I talked about the core competencies, which were just being launched. Um, and, uh, and so I made these two presentations to them. And I also met the first five court administrators who had been hired as true court administrators, not the army guys and military guys that Pam just talked about. And then he said that they were about to launch and try to do a training program to, to put trained court administrators across the 2,500 courts across the Soviet Union, uh, the, the Russian, it's not Soviet Union at that point. So that got me going. And so when I came back, uh, I wrote an article for the court manager about our trip and such. And so this was the cover article back in, in the year, uh, early 2000 about that, of that trip to Russia and that training program. So from that point forward, um, uh, the Russians invited us back. I was on a team for a USAID project to do pilot courts and eventually partnered with Pam Ryder Lahi, who's gonna talk in a minute, uh, with a Canadian project in, in, the, in the Russian courts. And we did pilot courts uh, to train court administrators and, and do model courts and eventually a, a training curriculum, which I'll talk about later with another question. So that's how I got involved. Of all the assignments you've been on, can you tell me about one where you were able to apply the NACOM core competencies in an international context? How did it work out? Janet? I'll preface my comments by sharing my experience with the drills and the duck and cover. <laughs> I grew up in Los Alamos, New Mexico, the home of the atom bomb. And I am here to tell you, we did regular drills. We hid under our desks. The whole town evacuated on cue. So I fully understand some of those drills. Now on to our topic at hand. My international engagements have included consulting and teaching in places like Australia, Brazil, Serbia, and the Pacific Islands. I'll comment on my work in the Pacific Islands, which included teaching in Guam, Palau, and Micronesia, with participants from those areas, as well as the Marshall Islands and American Samoa. My work included some nine different engagements with them where I presented to anywhere from 25 to 60 court leaders, including judges. Early on, I presented content from the earlier version of the NACOM core curriculum content on topics like case flow management, human resources, and leadership. In more recent years, I presented on the actual current NACOM core curriculum, and on one occasion even made use of these booklets that NACOM uh, published and built exercises around them. The recent presentations included an overview of all 13 curriculum and competencies, including invitation for the participants to do some exercises and analyze their respective court use of those curriculum and competencies. My observation is that the nine engagements gave me an opportunity to learn about their culture and their system and to appreciate the nuances. Because of our work together over many years, I was no longer a stranger. And one of the key takeaways was I was able through the teaching and the interaction acting with them to help them realize that some of the challenges they were experiencing were very, very parallel to what any court leader in the US and Canada would experience. Things like leadership challenges, things like dealing with ethical issues, things like implementing change, motivating staff, and dealing with powerful individuals. As the return engagements occurred, because I was no longer a stranger, the, teach the, the tenor of the teaching became more collaborative and more sharing. And they were able to take concepts from the NACOM core competencies and apply them. Admittedly, not 
lock, stock, and barrel, not all at once, but they were able to latch on to concepts and apply them. Another interesting side note, one of my high school classmates from Los Alamos, New Mexico, is an associate justice on the Supreme Court of Guam. Now, who would have ever thought that the two of us from that environment would end up in the court system? But, but that's my story of how the NACOM core competencies were useful. Norman? Well, I, 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 I've applied the, the core competencies in basically everywhere I went, I, for everywhere from Albania to Moldova to Serbia to Ukraine, and but especially in, in my biggest thing I think I, I'm going to highlight is in Russia. We got to the point where we said, well, you know, this is great. We've got these pilot courts. We want to spread this knowledge across the country, but there needs to be a training program um, to be able to help um, foster that so that they, these court administrators who had, were well-intentioned and wanted to do a good job, but hadn't had the right, the right background and training. So we, our project um, that was originally with David Vaughn and Betty Barto as the head and chief of parties there, um, and David was in Russia before he went over to uh, Ukraine. Um, and uh, uh, we, the Russian court said, okay, let's set up a training program. And so the Academy of Justice, which is a lot like the, some a hybrid of the National Judicial College here in the United States and the Administrative Office of the Courts uh, and the federal courts, uh, the Federal Judicial Center, um, partnered with us to develop a curriculum, a training program for court administrators in Russia. And we, we relied a lot on the core competencies on that, just like happened in Ukraine. So um, uh, it's, it's had a huge impact, I think, worldwide. And we've just given you a couple of examples of the NACOM core competencies uh, having a huge influence on training. Uh, you know, I just mentioned the five or six countries I've been in, but it's, but it's, it's all over the world um, uh, that it's been used to to uh, model the way in terms of what the curriculum should be for effective court administration. We're gonna break away here for a short bit of outreach. Michelle Oaken talked to us about NACOM's International Committee. We're quite fortunate to have Jeff Apperson, Vice President of the National Center for State Courts International Division. Jeff, tell us about what the International Division is all about. Uh, the National Center for State Courts International Programs Division has grown quite dramatically over the uh, last 10 years. We have about 35 programs in almost uh, 20 countries with offices in each location, covering most regions of the world. Um, we are programmatically involved in areas such as court administration, mock trials, judicial discipline, gender-based violence, gang violence, criminal justice reform, police and prosecutorial training. And we also have some unique developments uh, that are what we call direct programs with countries like Nigeria, Barbados, Guyana, um, Trinidad and Tobago, where we're building a consortium to introduce uh, case management systems that are collaboratively built among the countries. So overall, I have a staff of about 10 managers broken down by region. And uh, we, do, we were doing a lot of travel before COVID, but COVID had cut our program activity down a little bit, but we're seeing a reemergence in that activity. So overall, uh, we look forward to 2021, 2022, and uh, continuing to increase our activities uh, globally. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. I think we can all see that the National Center is deeply involved in international work. It's only going to provide NACA members with more opportunities in the future. Now let's return to our panel discussion. Have you ever hosted international guests visiting your home court? What was it like? What did they want to see? What did they want to know? Pamela Ryder Leahy? Yes, we have many times. And uh, I find when they come to our court, they're like sponges. Contrary to what people might think that they want to do all this, what I call um, legal tourism, they also want to spend as much time as they can in the courts. And we're kind of unique here in Newfoundland, Labrador, because I have access from the entry level court, the first level court, right to the Court of Appeal and even our Lieutenant Governor and Governor House. Um, so they're so 
thrilled to be able to see every aspect of a court, an operational court. They want to spend time in the registries. They want to look at our domestic violence court or drug courts or mental health courts. Uh, we even have a program lunch with a judge. They want to sit in on that. So they're, so they're like sponges in terms of what they take away. But I also find what's really important when we host international delegations is they also want to know how we live. And that doesn't mean taking them to the touristy things to, you know, they, they, they're going to get a touristy trip to do sightseeing, but they want to know how we live. So every time we've had an international delegation, I've always had them, had them at my home for what I call a family dinner. And my family are here and we cook and we share experiences. And unlike going to other countries, Norman and Pam, in Russia, you would know the big banquets that they lay out, food upon food upon food. Um, you know, initially when they were first, my first trip I was going to host at my house, my first delegation, sorry, I was like, oh my goodness, I should be getting all this food out. And I thought, no, that's not the way we do things here. We have like an appetizer, an entree, we have dessert, we, you know, put bread and stuff on the table. So they were really enthralled to see how we actually live. And also I've been able to get our judges to do a wine and cheese reception at some of their houses. So again, I think they really appreciate being invited into the homes and seeing how we actually live. Cause I know there's a lot of cameras taking pictures whenever uh, they've been here. Janet? In one instance, the court I was with hosted a delegation of judges from the Republic of South Korea. And it was a great opportunity to learn what their questions were and to share with them. It became quickly apparent that they really valued the informal chance to sit with other judges, peer judges, informally around a conference room table and just pepper them with questions. They wanted to know how the judges handled busy calendars and heavy workloads then they wanted to see what the court layout was, go look in a courtroom. The visiting judges really valued the time with these other peer colleague judges in an unscripted way. And it was a marvel to watch it. I also remember how they came bearing gifts and generosity of sharing things from their culture. It was just a wonderful opportunity for the mutual country sharing. Pam Harris? Um, it's, I, I can't disagree with anything that Pam or Janet has said. We've experienced the same thing here in Maryland. Um, I don't know exactly how many delegations we've had, but it's, it's more than a hundred. We're, we're close to DC. So it, it's easy for delegations to, to come to Maryland. Um, they've, you know, they come through National Center, um, uh, Chemonix, Library of Congress, USAID, State Department programs, and others. Um, we, we've hosted delegations and courts here at the AOC, um, and with our open world programs at the Library of Congress, we host delegations for at least four days and four nights in our homes. So we have volunteers, court volunteers, or maybe sometimes not a court, sometimes a next door neighbor to a group, um, that, that host folks in, in, in their homes for at least four of the, of the seven days that they're here. And that can get a bit tricky with, with language barriers um, because not always people, you know, we don't have the, the uh, interpreters for the home visits. They're there for, for the educational portion. Um, but somehow we always persevere uh, and so many times tears have been shed upon departures. Even when there's language barriers, people both on the American side um, and the foreign delegation side are, are so appreciative to have the experience to learn from one another. They wanna know everything, just as Pam and Janet said. Um, uh, they are like sponges. Uh, you name the subject matter the courts handle and we've presented on it. Um, most importantly, I think we prepare all of our presentations based on what they have asked to see. And we have never ever proposed topics or workshops or presentations to delegations where we imposed what we thought they should know. Uh, we've never done that and we will never do that. Um, and, you know, they want to see everything after the educational component is over, after a long day, they still have eight or 10 
or 12 hours in them um, to see to, to see whatever they can see. And of course, there's always a night they have to take them shopping. <laughs> they, they, they want to see the American shopping experience. Um, and they have an insatiable appetite when it comes to Maryland crabs. They cannot get enough of Maryland crabs. And they're very disappointed when, ha- when we have delegations here uh, that come in the dead of winter when we can't sit out and just eat crabs <laughs> because there are none. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's a wonderful, um, cultural experience as well. What did you find to be the most unexpected aspect of living in a foreign country? John? I think maybe my experiences differ or my perspectives differ a little bit because, um, my focus has been outside of the U S. Um, so in, in some ways, um, my perspective differs a little bit because, um, I was always working outside of the U.S. and never in the U.S. courts. But in in many respects, I think working outside of the U.S. has given me a better appreciation for the importance of individual interactions with the courts in shaping perceptions about government broadly. Um, Because I've worked in mostly post-conflict and transitioning democracies where the goals that we've had have been in either restoring or creating public trust and confidence where there wasn't necessarily public trust and confidence to begin with. And it really gave me an appreciation for the essential work of the courts in, in, that I wouldn't necessarily have had had I not worked in those settings where you really see the lack and the absence of of legitimacy of the courts and how that impacts everyone's perception of government. Pam Harris? Um, I have two things I would like to share, uh, but I want to start with saying that I've never lived in country uh, like John. I've I've never done that. Um, The first thing I want to to stress is I've been in 14 countries on rule of law initiatives over the past 20 years. And to this day, to this day, I am still so amazed with the judges and the administrators and clerks who long for change in their judicial systems. They want to make their courts better. They want to do their jobs better. They want their children, their families to live in a stable community, protected equally under law. They dream of having people respect their professional roles. They dream of efficiency, so cases don't take years or decades for resolution. They dream of not having the executive branch involvement in their work or their daily decisions. You know, they they dream of having their judiciaries function like ours here in the US, Canada, or or the EU. Um, If we all had just one tenth of their perseverance and dedication to improving the administrative uh, administration of justice, look where we could take our own courts um, because they have a need and they want to make that change. The second um, unexpected experience is a story about my first trip to Russia and some people have heard this before, um, but I, you know, it, it was an amazing, it was an amazing experience. Now you remember the old war, the old Cold War stuff. So you gotta put yourself into my perspective here. So upon arrival, we were escorted by a driver and the equivalent of a state court administrator for the St. Petersburg region, who both purportedly did not speak any English. Um, And we proceeded in a caravan of old Russian built sedans. um, And to this day, I swear that the exhaust pipe in our car was vented to the back seat of that car. Um, Anyway, we traveled through long, straight, narrow roads for hours, um, seemingly never seeing another car. Um, They would stop every once in a while, and we wouldn't know what was going on. They'd pull over, and they'd speak in Russian, and they'd get in the trunk, and they would do something, and they'd close the trunk, and and then we'd get in the car, and we'd go again, and go again. And then all of a sudden horns honked and all of a sudden we take a left and turn into this wooded area and the judge I was with and I were just bouncing in that back seat. I mean, there was no road. We just went into the woods. And I leaned over to the judge at the time and I said, is this where they're going to kill us? (laughs) 
Well, the story goes on um, and on, and I, and I won't I won't go into all of it. Um, but actually, what they presented us with is we got through the woods and entered this beautiful meadow, and they presented us with a lovely picnic with locals dressed in authentic costumes and providing Russian music and folk dance and food, um, and just toasts, the many toasts to the beginning of new friendships. <laughs> So it was a lovely start to a long relationship as I returned to Russia 15 times over 11 years and hosted many, many other foreign delegations in Maryland um, over my career. And for those of you who want to uh, see you at the next NACOM conference, I'll tell you the rest of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Janet? So two things come to mind for me. The first is on these engagements, I look at it as a, a need to both share knowledge and information and avoid being overly imposing of certain values, maybe even US values, without consideration of the local culture and the local environment, even though the purpose of engaging is to invite change. The other thing that came to mind is the importance of going with the flow with the local community and the local culture. To me, this is evident in the food, the dress, the differences in formalities of court operations. Yes, thatched roofs. Yes, courtrooms that are essentially outdoors under a roof. And the differences in processes and formalities. None of it was wrong but all of it was different and grounded in the different culture. And on the topic of gender bias, things like clan or tribal or familial hierarchies show up after you spend some time with the other culture. It's not wrong. And I always looked at it as I need to remember to value and appreciate that difference. Pamela Ryder Leahy? I guess. My projects have meant that I've gone to the countries for three to four weeks at a time. Um, so I'm not quite living there like John would have done, but I'm there long enough to, to you know, go around and do things on my own. So on one of my trips, um, I went and decided I would do a uh, Vietnam cooking course. It was being offered by a cooking school and I thought that would be a fun thing to do on a Saturday. And they took us to a wet market. And the wet market um, is where the animals, um, cows and pigs, are killed around three o'clock in the morning. And they bring them to the market and they use absolutely every aspect of the animal. So let's take a pig. And they use the hoofs, the snout, everything, the ears, it's all hung around. And uh, we went around this wet market with the instructor from the cooking school because we were picking up ingredients and um, she was pointing out how different things were being used. So again, even the blood, the blood was let and they used the blood. So we go back to the cooking school and she is boiling eggs that were fertilized eggs and uh, she drops them in a pot and then she picks them up. I've never seen anyone use chopsticks to peel an egg before, but she did. And the way she was holding the chopsticks, it just kind of unfurled. And it was this little chicken, because I mean, eggs, chickens, we all know what comes first. But it was this little chicken that had been cooked in this egg. And that is considered a delicacy in Vietnam. So they, they eat that. And in restaurants, they actually call it a hot pot and break it and throw it in the pot. It's a little bit cruel in the way we think of things, but that's perfectly normal in Vietnam. So to go on with uh, an aspect, I was at one of my training courses and uh, I was sitting in a restaurant and I was chewing on something. It was a buffet and I took a little bit of everything. I was chewing on some food and uh, it was really a rubbery feel to it in my mouth. So I asked my interpreter next to me what, what this particular dish was and he goes, oh, pig fallopian tube delicacy. So it gives me a new appreciation for how other countries don't waste anything. They utilize every aspect of an animal. And back to the wet market, they when the, the wet market that's been there, that the animal that's been killed, when that's close to being sold out, 
Only then will they go and ask somebody to kill another animal so they use it because everything is sold fresh. So, so I found that very incredible in the sense they use absolutely everything. And I think it comes from um, a certain amount of poverty and having to make do with, with what they have and to utilize everything. So I found that as one of the most unexpected aspects of, of living in, in Vietnam. John, what are organizations like the National Center looking for when they're seeking court professionals to work on international assignments? What we typically look for are, are those who have engaged in problem solving and demonstrate an interest in, in problem solving. And that means beyond just problem solving courts, but those who have worked in, for instance, case management and confronted challenges and been part of solutions and can demonstrate what they've done. Um, looking at those who have worked with resource constraints, which all courts share, um, and really looking at those who demonstrate an interest in learning and sharing, um, more so than necessarily those who might have a specific uh, singular area of expertise, although that there is a place for expertise in these assignments. But more often than not, we are looking for problem solvers and people interested in exchanging with others around how to solve problems that courts face. What type of assignments could NACA members expect to perform abroad for organizations like the National Center? Sure, there, there's a variety of different assignments and, it, it, and it, as, as mentioned previously, I think it, it varies on what you're trying to do in the diff different assignments. In some cases, there are speaking engagements, participation in conferences, uh, opportunities to serve as trainers and perhaps specific NACUM core competencies. Uh, or opportunities to volunteer and serve as mentors or hosts for visiting delegations, uh, but also serving as mentors in, in different countries. Uh, when, when people have time and are available uh, to serve as consultants, there are opportunities for consulting. It often takes um, a, a specific length of time that you would need to be able to, to give to specific assignments. Uh, but there are a variety of ways to become involved, um, and we encourage people to, to become involved um, in, to the extent that they can. How can NACA members demonstrate interest in becoming involved in international work? Well, a great way uh, to demonstrate interest is to write me at uh, international at ncsc.org. Other ways to become involved are to be involved in NACAM and in the NACAM in NACOM's International Committee um, and working in the kind of problem solving fora that exists in the United States so, or in, in uh, where NACOM members are working. Those opportunities that might include participating in NACOM courses or participating in the Institute for Court Management or in the Reform Implementation Lab initiatives at, the, at NCSC. Those are opportunities to become involved in NACOM member networks, and then also to learn more about the international work that NCSC does and to, to be in contact with us. Again, that's international at ncsc.org. And that's a, a good first way to be in touch. The stories our panelists have told us were certainly engaging. But before we sign off, let's get back with Michelle Oaken for some logistical information for those folks who've now gotten hooked on the prospect of international work. Michelle, how often does NACOM's International Committee meet? And where does one find out about joining a meeting? The committee generally meets quarterly unless we're working on a specific project that might require additional meetings. And those that could, might be interested in joining our committee, feel free to contact me for specific meeting information and any other details regarding the International Committee. Not to steal anything away from NACOM's committee, but tell us about the International Association for Court Administration, IACA. So Peter, the International Association for Court Administration, their purpose is to promote professional court administration and management in emerging democracies and other countries pursuing the rule of law. Like NACOM, IACA holds yearly conferences which focus 
on education and networking. And a conference is in the works right now for 2022 March in Helsinki, Finland. Nakam and Ika have partnered on projects, whether it's publications or, as I mentioned earlier, our court association templates. And we value our partnership with Ika. And there is available to Nakam members a dual membership which you can find information about on NACOM's website under membership. And it's, I believe, under the Join Us tab from the homepage of the website. And where can folks find information about the committee on the NACOM website? Under committees and under membership, you will find the international tab. You can find our agendas and minutes and under that tab under committees. And then all of the resources that I had mentioned earlier that the committee has been working on for the last number of years can be found under resources on the website as well. And it can be accessed through the homepage. My thanks to Janet Cornell, Norman Meyer, Pam Harris, Pamela Ryder Leahy, and John Cipperly for their stories and their experiences about international work. This is an area that I know captures the imagination of a lot of NACOM members. My thanks also to Jeff Apperson and Michelle Oaken for filling us in on the NACOM International Committee and the international work that is being done by the National Center for State Courts. My thanks finally to you court professionals out there watching today's episode. I hope that we've enticed you to join the International Committee and maybe even to try your hand at some international assignments. Join us in June for another episode dealing with the issues facing our courts. This has been the Court Leaders Advantage podcast series. I'm Pete Kiefer, and thanks for watching. Thanks for joining us today. The Court Leaders Advantage is a regular podcast on courts and court administration. Today's episode will be available on our website, on YouTube, on Facebook, on iTunes, on Instagram, and on Twitter. Become part of the conversation. If you have questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes, email us. Our address is CLA Podcast, that's all one word, at nakamnet.org. Did you hear an interesting comment by one of the panelists that you'd like to listen to again, but you don't want to search the entire episode to find it? The additional resources section on the web page contains a question time marker sheet. Just find the discussion question on the sheet, and next to it is the time that question was asked. You can then quickly fast forward to that time in the episode and listen to the panelists' comments. Remember, if you don't have time to watch an episode, you can always listen to the audio version. Listen in your car or on the bus on your way to and from work. You never have to miss an episode. I'm Pete Kiefer, and on behalf of our guests, the Court Leader website, and the National Association for Court Management, thanks for watching. The views, information, and opinions expressed during this episode are solely those of the host and the individual presenters. They do not necessarily represent the position of the National Association for Court Management.